Well, good morning, Evangel family and friends. They're gathering online. It's Pastor Mike, and we are going to continue our series in 1 Peter. First, we'd like to open up in prayer and just pray for our nation, pray for our church family and our friends um, across western New York. And Lord, I just ask at this time, God, that we, as we go into this, this message, Lord, that you would be with your people. You would speak to their hearts and their lives, God. And there are many of us at this moment who are sick, Lord, struggling. God, I ask that you would touch them. We have a lot of families, Lord, that have gotten COVID, Lord, and right now are in the quarantine process. Give them hope and peace, Lord, I pray. God, we pray for those individuals that have contracted this illness, Lord, that they would be able to breathe, Lord, that they would be healthy and whole, and God, that you would bring them on the other side. Lord, we pray for our nation and continue to pray for unity, Lord. In a time when things are just going all different ways, there's great division, there's hatred. Lord, we need you. You are the answer, God. It's not whether you belong to a blue party or a red party. It belongs to you. Do we belong to you? You bring peace. You bring that security. And God, I just ask that you would touch this nation in Jesus' name. Bring us back to you. Lord, we are struggling with our values, with our morals, Lord, with our ethics. It's because we've taken our eyes off you. Bring us back, Lord, I pray. Bless this nation. Speak to the new president that we have. God, that you would use him for your glory and your purpose in this country. Lord, I ask that you would be with us here in this church. Give us direction and peace, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said, amen. One of the big questions I think that a lot of Christians ask themselves is, what is my purpose? What is it? And this is a question that people ask pretty regularly. You know, when I was in high school, one of the big things was as I was becoming a senior, and probably this is for you as well, is what do I do with my life? Do you remember that dread, that feeling of now what? For four years, you placed all your time and emphasis and effort in your school and that identity. And then it comes to an end, and you're left with that choice of what, where now? What school do I go to? What, what is my major? What do I do after that? And then remember college, it goes even into early college years until you figure out this is where I'm supposed to be and this is what I'm supposed to do. Well, unfortunately, sometimes Christians don't figure that out and they're left to wonder Sunday morning by Sunday morning, what is my purpose in God? What is the calling that God wants me to accomplish. I know one thing, if you were to pull most Christians and ask what your purpose is, you know, and did you miss it? There'd be great fear. I don't want to miss God's calling. I don't want to miss his direction. We usually think, though, about the calling of God with more higher or noble purposes. We sometimes fail to think about the purposes that God has given us each and every day. Does the Bible say anything about the purpose for Christians? And I want to tell you that it turns out that First Peter does have a bunch of things to say about purpose for Christians in general. We find it in the second chapter of First Peter. So if you turn with me in your Bible to First Peter chapter 2, we're going to go ahead and break this down. We'll read the first three verses and then verses 4 through 10. So, 1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So that you may grow up in your salvation, now that you tasted that the Lord is good. Lord, in the next few moments, Lord, we're going to share, God, what you're saying through this book. And God, I just ask that you would be with me. 
Lord, that the words that I share wouldn't just be my opinion because that's hollow and meaningless. But God, that it'd be the very words of you. Help us, Lord, to be changed by the gospel and its message, conforming into the image of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's break it down here. In 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3, Peter starts out with a list of ways not to be. He says, get rid, rid yourself of malice, that's the desire to do evil, self-deceit, which is lying, rid yourself, he says, of hypocrisy. That's when your words and your deeds don't match together. You say one thing, but you do the other. It's a two-faced kind of you. It says, rid yourself of envy. Don't have to really explain that, what envy is, and being envious of other people. Rid yourself of slander. Slander is the false and damaging statements about others. Get rid of these things. And the idea of getting rid is casting off or laying aside. It almost gives the idea of taking off a garment and clothing yourself in something else. Notice what he says, get rid. Not God is going to take, but you, Christian, get rid Rid yourself. It's an action that requires you to do something. And that's one of the first purposes that that Peter says is to rid yourself. Now we look at this, it's like that dual nature. It is the old ways, the old self. And before Christ, most of us were like this. Not happy people, so to say. Not good people, so to say, although if you would have asked us at this time, oh yeah, I'm pretty good and moral. But we fell in that category of being deceitful, having malice in our hearts, certainly hypocritical, envious, and slandering others. Purpose number one is to get rid of that. Put those down, put it aside. Then Peter gives us purpose number two. And what is that purpose? It's to actively crave the Lord. Now, he gives a metaphor here. First, he says, like babies, right? Like newborn babies. So he talks to the Christians and tells them, like a baby craves pure milk, so you too should crave the pure milk of Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. So crave the word of God. Spiritual milk. That should be your second purpose. Not only are you getting rid of the old self actively, and that's a daily thing. Paul talks about crucifying himself daily. But also, we are to crave the spiritual goodness that comes from the word of God. Why? Why is that important? There's a benefit to it. And what Peter says here is that it leads to you growing up in your salvation, to grow in maturity. That is the purpose of every single Christian. And let me tell you, it doesn't get there by accident. There are specific things you must do. And coming to church on a Sunday morning, or in our case right now, sitting through a a sermon online doesn't quite cut that. You must get rid of the old self. You must actively crave Jesus Christ. Spend time with him. Read his word so that you grow and mature in Jesus Christ. That is a big purpose. Now, what he's talking about, growing up in your salvation, what he's talking about is that end goal in mind. When we've reached heaven, when we've obtained that. That is the goal he has in front of us. And the purpose is to grow until that day comes. Why? In verse 3, it talks about because the Lord is good. And tasting that spiritual milk is good. It's a benefit to you. So, The Greek word here of good, it doesn't have an equivalent in English. 
What it means, it's kind, eternally useful. It's fit for use. It's virtuous. It's pleasant. Now, I don't have Tim Horton's coffee with me, but this morning I did. And it's almost like it gives this kind of illustration. You take that first sip and you're like, oh, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the stuff. That's the kind of sense that it gives. It's good. Crave it. It's a benefit to you. Now, verse 3 also works in front of verse 1, if you will. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. There is a better way, as Peter says, and that is Jesus Christ. And it would be good and profitable for you if you crave him and put off, cast off the other. Purpose. That is our purpose. Now, the metaphor here, we've seen it. First is a simile like newborn babies. What I see from that is that his audience that he's writing to are newer Christians. That's why he uses the terms of like newborn babies and crave spiritual milk to give them that understanding. But he does not want them to stay there. And that is a key point, church. You should not be spiritual milk all your life. There should be a process of growing and maturity where you're growing in your faith and into your salvation. But it's a choice that we must make, and it matters. So what is the metaphor that we see here? The metaphor is that Jesus Christ is food that is fit to help us grow. Now, that's not uncommon to what even Jesus Christ had taught. He talked about being the bread from heaven, right? He talked about the water that if you take and taste of him, that you'd never thirst again. So Peter is building upon that and saying he's like the spiritual milk that causes you to grow. But again, that purpose is to grow in him. And the question to ask yourself, are you growing? Have you grown over the course of this year? Or have you stayed the same? Since you've accepted Christ into your hearts, have you been growing continuously or have you stagnated in your growth? Are you still receiving milk all these years later? One of the other things I think about is sometimes in our churches we get the idea that, hey, it's all about us. The gospel is all about us to make us feel better, to take care of those you know, weekly kind of struggle and mundane feelings that we have and the depression and anxiety that kind of latch on to us through the week. And okay, it's my time on Sunday. Now I get to get rid of that. Thanks, God. I'll take a quick sip and I'll be on my way. But that's not the purpose and the plan. Let's continue to read here in verses 4 through 8. Peter says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human, humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, see, I have laid a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. There's that destined again. Let's talk about this. Where do we find purpose for the Christian in this? Oh yeah, we saw it in verses one through three, but what about four through eight? Peter talks about as you come to him. He talks about you, first of all, coming to him. Who are you and who is him? You is the same people Paul has, or Peter has been talking about. These are the Christians, albeit kind of new Christians, that are in Asia Minor. Remember we talked about modern Turkey. So spread out through this large geographical area. Now, This, I think, shows the plan of God in salvation. 
Jesus, the Messiah, rejected by Jews, accepted by Gentiles, an evidence of this group of people in this area and in this time. They were chosen by God. Hmm. Who is the him? Well, it's no other than Jesus Christ. Notice that here in verse 5 and 4, he's described as a living stone. That's kind of a peculiar way to speak about Jesus, a living stone. After all, who's seen a stone that's living? It's not normally how you describe a stone. But looking at this, what is this whole stone analogy about? It's clear in literature and in other readings and in this time period that Jews and Christians viewed the Messiah as a stone or a rock. That indeed when the Old Testament talks about stones, when it talks about rocks, that it is attributed to the Messiah that would come. Now, the Jews didn't see Christ as the Messiah. Hence, they rejected him. But Christians did. But still, the analogy works for both groups. If you were to be able to just talk to one of these Jews at this time and say, what is it talking about in the Old Testament? What talks about the rock or a cornerstone? That sort of thing. Oh, that's the Messiah. It would have been common knowledge. And Peter plays upon that common knowledge here. Not only for the Jew converts that might be in the congregation or Jewish converts, but also the Gentile believers that have become Christians. They were aware of this. They were aware. Now, Peter uses three Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah where it talks about the Messiah being a rock, a cornerstone. We see it first in his first analogy in I lay a stone in Zion, a precious cornerstone, and that is found in Isaiah 28, 16. He then goes to use Psalm 118.22, when he says the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then he goes to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, when he says a stone that causes people to stumble and fall. That's interesting. We'll talk about all of that. But first of all, this rock This stone, this living stone, literally mirrors the statement that Jesus makes to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 18. When Jesus asked the disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? And Peter, who was the spokesperson for the disciples, says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, Peter, a wordplay, rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. It starts in verse 18. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It's clear that Peter is then giving back rock, title, Messiah to Jesus here. He is the Messiah. He is the one that we were looking for. It's also, I think, clear imagery of building a building or a temple in this case. He, Jesus, is called the cornerstone in verses 6 and 7. And you might ask yourself, what in the world is a cornerstone and why is that so important? Well, let me tell you, in ancient architecture, you're like, okay, this is where I'm glazing over, Pastor. I don't want to know about ancient architecture. It's going to be brief and to give you more of an insight of why this is important. The cornerstone was the most important foundation rock. It was the most costly and the one that was most carefully chosen. It was the stone that joined two walls of the building. After that cornerstone was laid, the rest of the building could be determined, the direction was determined, and the rest of the building could be built, but not before the cornerstone was laid. And Peter says, Jesus is the cornerstone. 
He says this stone, this living stone, was rejected by men, but chosen by God. Gives me the imagery of the temple. When the temple was being built, lots of time, effort, energy, and money would be placed in finding the correct stone building the correct cornerstone, carefully taking that cornerstone out and placing it on the temple mound. Great care. And this great care and the choosing that God showed in Jesus Christ is a similar thing. Now, the builders rejected this stone, it says. And who were the builders? The G- Jewish leadership and the nation as a whole. They did not think this cornerstone was worthy, but understand that God saw it as the most important part of redemption. And indeed, God used the cornerstone of Jesus Christ for his redemption plan. And it's what the kingdom of God is built upon. Again, he's called a living stone in verse four. Like I said, that's a strange description, living stone. But this is playing on the fact that Jesus Christ didn't just die for our sins, but was resurrected and is alive, hence the living stone. He didn't remain in a grave. He is the foundation of our faith. And he talks about, Peter says, as you come, purpose, You need to come to Jesus Christ. And the idea is not just once for salvation, but it's a continual coming. And as you do that on a daily basis, you become like living stones. You don't become the living stone, Jesus Christ, but you become like him. And you become like living stones. Those who trust in him will never be put to shame. This kind of reminds me of the idea of Jesus that talks about in John 6 that I will lose none that the Father has given me and I will resurrect them at the last day. You won't be put to shame. You won't be forgotten. Also reminds me of Matthew 10, 32 and 33 where Jesus says, when you acknowledge me before man, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. There is no shame. You will never be put to shame when you come to him. But we must come, and there's great purpose in there. Another section here that we see is those who reject him will stumble and fall because of him. And that's a tough one to deal with. But it is a promise to all believers in Christ. Now, who are the other stones If you've been paying attention, this should be easy. Again, this is the you. This is the Gentile Christians in Asia Minor. Again, purpose, come to Christ. Make it a continual thing. And as you do that, you are changed into the image of Christ. It's becoming like Jesus Christ. That's a major purpose of Christians. That's why we put away the old nature, rid ourselves of that. We crave time with him. We work out our salvation. We grow. We become like living stones, like Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, God takes us and he builds us into his spiritual house. That is a purpose for you to be used in the kingdom of God. Talks about it in verse five here. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. And here's the other part of that, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Hmm. What is the purpose of Christians? It's to be built and used in the kingdom of God. It's to be a holy priesthood. It's to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. We said one word that Christians don't like. It's a, it's a Christian cuss word. It's the S word, suffering. Well, here's another one, another Christian cuss word that we don't want to hear about, sacrifice. What's our purpose? To serve God, to sacrifice our wants, our desires, for his purpose. 
In church, that's where we get things wrong. We are so concerned about what we want. We are so concerned about what we want to accomplish on our own self that we fail to be like the holy priesthood that Peter talks about, giving ourselves in service to God, accomplishing his purpose, and offering our lives as a sacrifice to him. We get it backwards. We want Christ to sacrifice for us and then for us to do what we want to do. That's not Christianity. And that's a major cause why you and I don't grow. Let's bring this down a little further here. What does this holy priesthood in the spiritual sacrifice to God have to do with us? Well, what it tells me is that every believer has a connection to God the Father through Jesus Christ. You, if you are a believer, you, if you come to Christ, have a connection to God. You are right standing with the Lord. You know, one of the things that I used to struggle with as, you know, a younger man, I didn't know that God would hear me. I, you know, we had, in, in college, we had a prayer chapel room at the end of our dorm. And there was a prayer log that you could, you could pray, and then you could also put in, if God answered your, your prayers, or if you had prayers that you were really struggling with, or things in your life. And you put it in there, and, you know, I would struggle often because I would go to that prayer room, and I would pray, and it just felt like, My prayers went nowhere, and God didn't hear me. And I remember talking to my pastor at that time in the altar service. He called us down, and I went down, and he asked me the question, what can I pray with you about? And I told him, Pastor, I'm struggling right now. I don't know if God hears me. You know, I pray. It just feels like it's bouncing off the ceiling, really not going anywhere. And I'll never forget this. He said to me right there with everybody else, Okay, Mike, I, I, I think I understand. You don't think God can hear you, right? I said, no, I don't think he can hear me. And so I said, well, um, he said this to me. He said, this is what I want you to do in front of all these people right here at the altar. What I want you to do is I want you to scream obscenities at God. And I did this. And then he smiled and he said, what's the matter, Mike? Are you afraid he'll hear you? <laughs> and indeed I was. God hears us. What else does it tell me? That every Christian exists to serve God and offer their lives as a sacrifice to him. That you have a purpose and a meaning and that God has something specific for you. Does this mean that God has called all of us into full-time ministry? No. But how many of us and how many of you have done nothing for God? We haven't shined the light We haven't talked to anyone about what he's done for us. We just kind of come in on Sundays and go out, and maybe Wednesdays we we get a Bible study, and really nothing changes. It's not the purpose for you. There's something more. It means that you have a duty to God to serve him in your life. God has a plan. Hmm. Verse 8 has really the potential to cause trouble if we don't think it through. So let's look at it. It says, and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Here we go again. Predestination. We try to avoid this. This is a little icky. We're not comfortable with it, so let's just skip forward. Not going to do that. What does Peter talk about Jesus here? Jesus is a stone that causes people to stumble. He is a stone that makes people fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. Okay, we're first here, the first part. Jesus causes people to stumble and fall. I'm not, I'm not good with that, Pastor. I don't like what that sounds like. Then we read on. They stumble because they disobey the message. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I feel better now. But then it doesn't end there, which they were destined for. Pastor, I'm right back where I was. Now it's even worse. What does this mean? Okay. Chosen, remember. God's choosing is a major theme throughout 1 Peter. He has chosen Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. We see that in chapter 1. He chooses the elect who are the Christians in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, at this time. Chapter 1. 
He chooses Christ as the cornerstone. We see that in chapter 2 and what we just read. If he did all these choosings, there's also rejection, which is the flip side of that. So rejection is also part of the plan. How so? God knew beforehand, before the foundation of the world, before people roamed this planet, that they would not all choose him. Divine foreknowledge that was also discussed in chapter 1. This is alluded to in Mark chapter 8, 34 through 36. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and make, take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? It's implied in this passage that people can choose. And because they can choose that some will give the option not to follow Jesus, hence rejection. Some will reject it. Because some will reject it, it was determined that their fall would be the consequence of Jesus Christ. Follow that. Let's move on from here, verses 9 and 10. Peter has good news again for these church people. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God... Peter, again, brings in the concept of these believers being chosen by God. You're chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Let me tell you this. Why is Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, telling them these things? Because they probably didn't think that highly of themselves. Understand, at this time, if you were a Jew and converted, which there were Jewish converts in these churches, you would have been shunned by the families that you belonged to and cast out of society. You would have been a reject. If you were a Gentile at this time in the Roman Empire, if you chose to follow Christ, you would have been viewed as nuts, a crazy person, You would have been looked down on. Again, that casting off as a reject in society. You probably didn't feel too good about yourself. So when Peter brings in the idea of being chosen, that's to bring hope and encouragement to them. They were rejected like Jesus Christ was by men, but God chose them. Purpose. That is purpose. So, He gives them a purpose to look forward to. And it talks about in the last section here, they are to declare the praises of God in Jesus Christ. They were called out of darkness into light. They are tasked with telling the gospel to others in order to bring people out of darkness to light purpose. They are to put off their old self, verse 1, to crave time with God, verse 2, to grow in spiritual maturity, verse 2, to work out their salvation, verse 3, to keep coming back to Christ, verse 4, to be transformed into his image like living stones, in verse 5. They are to make their life a living sacrifice like a priest, in verse 5. They were the chosen people who would bring people Out of darkness, verse 9. Peter tells them they belong. In church, let me tell you, you belong. You may feel like that outcast, but you belong. Once you were not a people, now you are. Once you did not have mercy, now mercy has been extended to you. Are you a people, a person with purpose? Are you God's special possession? Have you experienced God's mercy? Have you come out of darkness to light? If you have not, you have the ability, the opportunity today to do so. All it takes is you acknowledging your need for Jesus and he will save you. 
If you have not, then you have the choice whether, whether to be a stone that God uses to build his spiritual house or you will be that person who stumbles and falls because of Christ, one or the other. If that is you, where you stumble and fall because of Jesus Christ, you will remain in darkness and will be under God's wrath without purpose or without his mercy. But if today, and you are looking at this and you're listening to this, and you are a Christian, if you are one of God's, if you have been taken out of darkness to light, then you have a purpose. Have you been fulfilling your purpose? Have you grown spiritually? Have you seen improvements in your character throughout your spiritual walk? Or are you stagnant? May I tell you, the way out is to crave Jesus Christ like babies do spiritual milk. It's to spend time with him. It's casting off the old self continually coming to him and being transformed into his image. That's what it takes. Have you been serving God with your life? Like the holy priesthood that Peter says. If not, then the choice is yours to find purpose in Christ or to stagnate. Being a stone, not in a building, but on the side. You have the choice to declare the praises of him who did so much for you. Let's pray. God, at this moment, Lord, for those that are struggling right now, they are under wrath. They have no purpose in their heart, but they acknowledge, I need you. Lord, as they cry out now, Lord, save me. God, that you would make a change in their heart, that you would save them and bring them from darkness to light and give them that great purpose. For the other ones, Lord, that call you Lord and Savior and acknowledge you as the living stone, Lord, that we would cast off those things of the old nature and we would crave you, a renewed craving, a renewed drive and purpose in our heart. Give that to us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, either if that was you before you've made a commitment to Christ or you're making a new commitment to Christ, you can share with us. You can call the office at 716-688-4941 and myself or one of the other pastoral staff would be more than happy to speak with you and pray with you. As always, we love you. Be kind to each other and to yourself. Make sure that you are spending time with the Lord this year. Make it your resolution. Next week, we'll have more of a live service. These are pre-recorded, but next week will be different. Can't wait to see you then. God bless. Take care.